Alright, hello hello and welcome to Adventures Among Ideas. Hope you brought your brains today because we are talking Heb. Donald Heb, that is. So now I'm no neuroscientist, but for me, from time to time I do uh, dip my toes into the torrent that is modern day neuroscientific research. Uh, one of my favorite ideas in this area is the cell assembly. I'll say why it's important to my more behavioral, psychological, cultural work in a bit. But first, Hebb, Donald Olding Hebb, 1904-1985, was a Canadian psychologist. Uh, most of his influential work was actually in the area of neuropsychology, basically looking at how psychological processes, such as learning, were tied to the behavior of neurons. He was interested in how biology meets psychology. The basic concept that allowed him to do this was the cell assembly. Now I've been reading through Hebb's work over the last couple of years, but today I want to focus or uh, refer to a relatively recent review article from 2013. It's called simply A Review of Cell Assemblies. This is by Christian R. Hike and Peter J. Passmore. And Hike, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce his name, but I looked up how other people pronounce it, H-U-Y-C-K, what I found online was Hike, is a professor of artificial intelligence, and Passmore is a professor of aging and geriatric medicine. So Hebb, to go back to Hebb, he first presented his theory in his now famous book, The Organization of Behavior. This was from 1949, and this has become uh, one of the canonical texts of neuropsychology. The great problem that Hebb was trying to solve in his book was perceptual uh, generalization. Perceptual generalization. This is answering the question of how, for example, we're able to recognize a chair as a chair on different occasions. How are we able to recognize that two different chairs are similar in some ways? Now, they're both uh, kinds of chairs but they're different in other ways, right? They might have different looks or whatever, but we consider them the same sort of thing. Or take a rat. Let's take a, talk about a rat that has learned how to respond in different ways to vertical and horizontal lines. We've got uh, vertical lines and horizontal lines, and they mean come to mean different things for the rat. So the rat gets to train, uh, gets trained to respond to solid lines but then when it sees lines made up of dashes, right, you can have lines that are dashes, lines which are just solid lines. So when, then when it sees lines made up of dashes, it responds in the same way as it responds to solid lines. So why? How is it able to generalize, generalize from uh, solid lines to dashed lines, which in some sense are very different things? Uh, so you find psychologists and philosophers and other others uh, wrestling with this problem throughout the early 20th century, and actually people are still wrestling with it today. It's one of those things that seems very simple and obvious because we do it all the time. It's just part of our normal daily life behavior, but it really gets harder to understand the more in detail you think about it. So Hebb's solution to um, to this problem was the cell assembly and i should point out that by cell he's talking he's really talking about neurons so we're talking about an assembly or an interconnected group of neurons and a basic definition is that a cell assembly is a group of neurons which have a greater than average probability of exciting each other so neurons are connected by synapses when a neuron sends a chemical to another neuron, there's a chance that it will cause the other neuron to fire. This is you say, how neurons communicate or how they're connected up through synapses. The synaptic connections between neurons in a cell assembly are stronger than their connections to neurons not in the assembly. They've got a greater probability of exciting each other, of making each other fire, than they do of making neurons in other parts of the brain fire, other assemblies fire. So, and therefore, when a small subset, a small subset of the larger assembly gets excited, the whole group tends to get excited. You don't need to excite the whole group to have, for example, an idea or perception, whatever. You just excite a part of it, and this part gets the whole thing going. 
And this is how Hebb explains that perceptual generalization happens. You see part of an object, and the sensory stimulation from this part of the object excites a part of the cell assembly associated with the concept of that object. And this causes the whole cell assembly to ignite. And then you recognize the object, what the object is. So you see just maybe the top of a chair, the side of a chair or something. And you recognize it as a chair, as a whole chair, as a whole concept of a thing that you know what it is. Um, I should point out that this is a theory about how things work. There's a lot of evidence. So it's a theory, right? There's a lot of evidence to support this basic idea, to support this theory. Um, but the behavior of individual neurons is extremely difficult to study. So something like proof of the cell assembly theory would require continuously tracking the behavior of many individual neurons over the course of various learning trials, over the course of the organism's development, and this is something we just can't do very well. So there are many variations on cell assembly theory that arose in the wake of Hebb's important work. Uh, in their review article, HP give, HP, Hike and Passmore, got abbreviations in my notes and in my head, but Hike and Passmore give three uh, principles, or four, kind of three or four, um, that they say make up the standard model. I think the first three come out of Hebb, basically, uh, and then there was a fourth one added. So the first one, the first principle, is that a cell assembly, a CA, so we often use CA to mean cell assembly, so if I, see, if I say CA sometimes, that just means cell assembly. But a CA, or cell assembly, is a relatively small set of neurons which encodes each concept. This is the first principle, so it encodes a concept. For every concept, there is a cell assembly. So cell assemblies can be composed of other cell assemblies in the way that you have minimal or atomic concepts and then concepts that are made out of other concepts. So let's say, for example, let's take an example. So let's say that a line is a simple or atomic concept, right? Just a, a straight line, let's say. Then a, uh, a triangle or a square is a more complex concept that makes use of the concept of lines because a triangle or a square is made out of lines and depends partly on that concept. Uh, Hike and Passmore don't say that much about what a concept is. For now, I'll say that a concept is a category to which some response can be made. So um, a concept may have some perceptual content. So for example, the concept of line has a certain perceptual content. When you think of the concept line, you may imagine an actual line. I think I often do this when I was writing this or thinking about how to talk about this. And I thought of the word line. I kind of see a line in my mind's eye, so to speak. Um, but a concept also has a behavioral content in that we know how to use it or what to do with it or how to make it and so on. So you know how to draw a line or how to use lines and this forms part of your concept of the line. I've talk about, talked about this in my uh, videos about meaning on YouTube. Anyway, uh, Hike and Passmore estimate that CA's cell assemblies consist of 10 to the 3rd to 10 to the 7th neurons. So uh, that's between 1,000 and 10 million neurons. So at the low end, it would be 1,000. High end of uh, you know, a larger cell assembly could be up to 10 million neurons. Um, and I've seen other estimates of this, so don't take that to be too precise. But anyway, they can be smaller or larger. Uh, the number of possible CAs seems to be nearly unlimited. Because like I said, you can have higher order CAs built from smaller CAs, and you can do this in many different ways. And neurons can also be part of more than one CA. So neurons can be part of many different CAs, the same neuron. Uh, of course, however many CAs a person actually has, you can probably only use a small number of them at any given time. This is, uh, uh, you know, this first principle is uh, that I've been talking about is also known as population or ensemble coding, or as kind of a version of um, population or ensemble coding, meaning that a special population or ensemble of neurons encodes something here, a concept. 
Uh, so that was the first principle. The second principle is that the neurons of a cell assembly can show self-sustaining persistent activity. Self-sustaining persistent activity. This is a long phrase. But a cell assembly is ignited or activated by some kind of chemical or electrical stimulation. Uh, this stimulation may be impulses from sensory receptors, right, coming from your eyes or ears or nose or whatever. Um, so they may be, uh, it may be stimulated from the sensory receptors, or it may be stimulation from a partially overlapping CA. So a, a CA can be ignited by another CA. Um, but after a CA is ignited, after the neurons that make up the CA are activated and start firing together, it can persist. It can continue after the stimulation goes away, after the stimulation stops, whatever the original stimulation was. It goes away, but the cell assembly keeps going on, keeps uh, reverberating, as we say. So this, is, this idea that it keeps working, it keeps functioning after the stimulation goes away is called reverberation. Right, like when you speak in an echoey room and a you know a big kind of echoey room, and the sound continues after you stop speaking. Let's call this a kind of reverberation. This reverberation happens because the cells in the cell assembly are interconnected in such a way that they cause each other to keep firing for a while after the original stimulation stops. So if you're looking at something and then close your eyes, you might continue to see it or some. Uh, kind of reduced version of it for a while because uh, the cell assembly or part of it is still reverberating. This is what uh, self-sustaining means here. The outside stimulation is gone, but the cell assembly keeps working. So for example, let's say that you have a CA of six neurons, A, B, C, D, E, and F. This is, of course, too much too small for real life, but we'll take it as a, a simplified kind of toy example here. Um, so A, let's say A gets ignited by some event in the brain, some stimulation coming into the brain or from elsewhere in the brain. A then ignites B, which ignites C, which reignites A, which uh, reignites B, which ignites D this time, which reignites C, C ignites E, which reignites B, going back to B, uh, B reignites D, then back to C and back to A, A ignites F, which reignites B, then on to C and on to E, and perhaps so on and so on and so on. Um, and this is all from a, a figure that I think originally appeared in um, Heb's book and is reproduced in uh, I can pass more's article. So anyway, you could look it up since I'm uh, not putting visuals on here. But anyway, the idea is these neurons are interconnected, so they keep uh, igniting and reigniting each other. So this reverberation and this reverberation helps account for things like short-term memories and certain kinds of after images. Like when you, like I said, when you've been looking at something for a long time and then you still see it when you close your eyes. I had some examples. Um, can think of some examples of this in my own life. Of course, I think there's some examples we all have, like looking at bright lights and so on. But I remember um, working in a FedEx warehouse when I was young. And when I came home to sleep after many hours of work, I'd close my eyes and I'd still see boxes coming <laughs> down the conveyor belt, right? In my kind of mind's eye or in my imagination, I'd still see boxes coming and uh, a similar thing happens after I've been driving for many hours. And I close my eyes and I still see the road going past me because I've been looking for so long at this kind of stimulation that the, uh, the cell assemblies keep reverberating even after I've closed my eyes, at least according to this theory. All right, so that was the second principle. Third principle, a CA's set of neurons, which represents a particular concept, is learned. So you're not automatically born with cell assemblies. They come about from changes in how neurons relate to each other, are connected to each other. And um, this happens for a variety of reasons, which we don't need to get into all of that. The key thing is that they're learned. And then the, there was a fourth principle that was added by Christoph von der Malsberg, a physicist and neuroscientist. 
Uh, this fourth principle is the principle of correlated activity. So correlated activity. This means that neurons are involved, uh, that are involved in responding to the same stimulus or that are involved in causing the same action. So neurons that are involved in kind of the same thing, they fire in synchrony. They fire together in a certain pattern. They're correlated. So when neurons are involved in the same bodily or cognitive event, they the firing times become synced up or correlated. Uh, there's a common saying in cell assembly theory that neurons that wire together fire together. But they're not just firing together. They're not just firing at the same time, but their firing patterns are synced up in a certain way. All right, so those are the four principles of the standard model of cell assembly theory. Uh, cell assemblies encode concepts. They are able to persist or reverberate in the absence of external stimulus or stimulation. Um, they are learned, and the neurons which make them up fire in synchrony. I should mention also that cell assemblies, so far as there is good evidence for them, uh, seem to be mainly in the cortex, the outer layer of the brain's tissue. Uh, the cortex is the main part of the brain where you get this reverberation going on. Uh, maybe also in the visual cortex for various reasons. Um, although cell assemblies seem possible in uh, some non-cortical areas as well. So in other parts of the brain besides the cortex. Uh, there are various other extensions of this theory, but I don't want to get into those details here. So we've talked about what cell assemblies are. I've said a bit about what a cell, cell assemblies are, kind of how they work, but what exactly do cell assemblies do? As I mentioned already, they categorize, they seem to categorize incoming stimulation. But along with this, they seem to form the basis of short-term memory and long-term memory, as well as a particular application of short-term memory called working memory. You may have heard of these different kinds of memory before, short-term, long-term, and working. Uh, categorization and the various kinds of memory seem to be related. Uh, so I may tell you, for example, remember the numbers 1, 6, and 8. So remember 1, 6, and 8. So to do this first, you have to recognize what I'm saying, and this means having access to long-term memories. So specifically semantic long-term memories of the categories involved. You have to have these long-term memories or semantic memories of the words, uh, you know, what I'm talking about, relating to what I'm talking about. Semantic memories uh, come about when we're exposed to something to learn what it is. So we all do this in school. You've learned in the past what the numbers 1, 6, and 8 are. When you hear the sounds 1, 6, 8, you categorize them as numbers of a certain kind. Uh, and they're, so they're relatively fixed long-term cell assemblies in your brain that have been formed in your brain. But if I give you the instruction, remember the numbers 1, 6, and 8 for a minute because I want to test your short-term memory, say, uh, the reason you'll probably be able to do this is because the CAs for those numbers, the cell assemblies for the, the numbers 1, 6, and 8, will continue to reverberate after I've stopped talking. So the 1, 6, and 8 CAs are temporarily linked together such that thinking 1 will ignite 6, which will ignite 8. When I tell you to remember 1, 6, and 8 for a minute, I'm actually uh, asking you to use your working memory, which is something like a, like a goal-directed use of short-term memory. So it seems to involve CAs, arguably, in the prefrontal cortex, which is involved, the prefrontal cortex is involved in things like setting goals. Um, and this is connected with uh, CAs in other areas which are involved in categorizing perceptions, in this, in this case, the sounds of uh, 1, 6, and 8. So when I tell you to remember 1, 6, and 8, it ignites a goal-based cell assembly in your prefront, uh, prefrontal cortex, which reverberates and st uh, sends stimulation to the CAs representing 1, 6, 8 elsewhere in your cortex. So that's kind of probably a simple way of how you might explain how this works. Um, so perhaps the next day, the linkages between 1, 6, and 8 will have gotten erased. So return to their kind of baseline normal levels. They're not any stronger than they were before because the connections between 1, 6, and 8 didn't get reinforced later on. You might have, you know, not have any particular reason to think 8 when you think 1. Um, 
but sometimes it will become its own long-term memory. I actually chose these numbers, 1, 6, and 8, because one day in junior high school, the number uh, 168 became a kind of a joke in my math class. And one of my, I don't remember what the joke was, but one of my fellow students said we should all try to remember 168 forever. And uh, there was this whole story about 168. Um, but so a linkage, kind of a linkage between the CAs for for those numbers, for the numbers 1, 6, and 8, was apparently formed in my brain, so that in certain contexts, the whole number, 168, will get called up. This is like remembering uh, your ATM code, I think, as opposed to four random numbers, where the site or the memory of the ATM, which itself is a, a cell assembly, stimulates the CAs representing your PIN, your number, your code. Uh, so, in fact, when I hear the number uh, 168, like if something costs $168, I'll often remember that day in uh, junior high math class, with me, uh, which means that the CA for 168 is part of a larger CA representing an event in my past. It's part of what they call an episodic memory. So episodic memory, as opposed to semantic memory, is memories of um, events or episodes but it makes use of semantic memory. So these, all these different kinds of memory are uh, related to each other and built on each other and use each other. Um, so it makes use of semantic memory, which I mentioned above. So semantic memory was memories of numbers and shapes and words and so on. Uh, but episodic memories seem to be formed through uh, mediation of the hippocampus. They talk about this in their article. Um, when the brain decides you know, quote unquote, decides that some group of perceptions is important when it, when an event has high value for you for whatever reason, a CA is formed in the hippocampus, which connects up with those semantic CAs that are involved in perceiving the situation. This is um, just a way to explain how I remembered the numbers 168 for 30 years or whatever it's been. Uh, so, I can pass more, discuss some other things in their paper, such as the various kinds of evidence for cell assemblies and the various models or simulations of cell assemblies. I'm not going to go into this because I don't really have the expertise to evaluate these kinds of evidence, and I get kind of lost with some of these things, talking about uh, simulations and so on. I don't have much experience doing computer simulations of uh, anything, <laughs> really. Um, I'll just so I'll just say that for me, cell assembly theory is important because it provides a way to make concepts and culture biologically concrete. So it's a way to make concepts concretely part of our organic biological nature. I'm the kind of person who wants to know in a very precise, very concrete way, very kind of hands-on, down-to-earth way, how concepts are transmitted from one body to another and maintained. How are they maintained in the body? I want to find some biological mechanism by which this happens, and uh, cell assemblies provide one such mechanism. So for me, it's not... It's not good enough to say that transmitting and remembering concepts are acts of the mind. I don't know what this means. I want to be able to potentially see how this works, or at least be able to imagine in some kind of concrete detail the physical processes that might be taking place. And I like how cell assemblies help you to do this at various levels of complexity. So you start with something relatively simple, a single neuron. And when you start connecting it more or less strongly to other neurons, and when you start connecting groups of neurons to other groups of neurons, or nesting groups of neurons inside other groups of neurons, you get many possible behavioral responses with different degrees of complexity. You got this whole complex um, thing going on out of just really simple components. And I think um, cell assemblies can really help bridge the psychological and the biological. This is a difficult problem. But when you recognize that um, cell assemblies are not just in the brain, but that at least many kinds of CAs must have uh, muscular and glandular consequences. The feel and the behavioral, behavioral consequences of thinking become much easier to understand. I think this is not emphasized um, 
as much in the literature on cell assemblies. That many kinds of cell assemblies probably have motor glandular components, which of course affect the rest of the body, not just the brain. So it's not just in your in your brain and this you know changes how we feel and act. So thinking changes how we feel and act. It's not just a, a brain thing, it's a whole bodily thing. Yeah, so anyway, this has been a kind of a brief introduction to cell assemblies using Hike and Passmore's review article, a review of cell assemblies. I expect I'll talk more about CA theory in the future as I use it in my own work, which involves um, biopsychosocial explanations of behavior. To conclude, let's test our short-term memories, why don't we, and see... Let's see if your CAs are firing on all cylinders. So, what were the four principles of CA theory? All right, pencils down. Very good. CAs, yes, indeed, CAs are small sets of neurons that encode concepts. CAs are capable of self-sustaining persistent activity. CAs are learned. And CAs consist of neurons firing synchronously in sync. All right. And that is all for today. Thanks for listening. Subscribe, like, share, blah, 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 and keep adventuring. Bye.